This is a video lecture on corporate level strategy. So unlike business level strategy that's seeking to find a competitive advantage within a single industry uh, and sometimes a single product, corporate level strategy is looking for a competitive advantage and creating value through participating in several different industries and markets. Uh, the markets can be uh, both product or geographic. Uh, these corporate level strategies are used to diversify their operations in the several marketed markets or business lines. Uh, firms use these strategies to create value through economies of scope, market power, and financial economies. Uh, diversification can also reduce risk, much like diversifying your stock portfolio. Uh, being in several industries uh, can allow the firm protection from risk and provide other benefits. Some examples of diversification, uh, GE, uh, which tends to acquire uh, firms to diversify, uh, is in many seemingly unrelated businesses. Their focus is to be the number one or number two in the industry or get out, uh, but they don't seem to care what that industry is. Uh, 3M has grown primarily organically and has many businesses clustered in a few related industries. Uh, even farther down the spectrum, MyLight uh, has many product extensions and product lines, um, but they're basically uh, all clustered in the same industry. Levels of diversification. Uh, single business. This is when a firm is earning more than 95% of its revenues from a single line of business. A dominant business is a firm that earns uh, above 70%, but less than 95% of revenue uh, from its main line of business. Related constraint. This is when a firm has uh, grown to the point where its main line of business is less than 70% of its revenue, and uh, its other lines of business share product, technological, and or distribution linkages with the main business, so they're very uh, closely related. Related Linked is a firm that operates in related markets, uh, but there are fewer linkages uh, relative to a related constrained type of diversification. And then finally, unrelated diversification is when a firm operates in multiple categories uh, with few, uh, if any, linkages between them. So an example of a single business is WD-40, uh, the product and the company are the same name. Uh, 1953, a small company called Rocket Chemical Company set out to create a line of rust prevention solvents and degreasers for use in the aerospace industry. It took them 40 attempts to perfect the water displacing formula and thus WD-40 was born. Uh, it was so popular that they uh, never got around to creating any other products in their uh, line of rust prevention solvents. In 1969, the company was officially renamed after its only product to WD-40 Co. Uh, in 1973, it went public. And since that time, the only new products that have been created are different types of can designs where uh, different nozzles, different sprays for wider and smaller areas. A dominant business, Donato's. Uh, primarily makes its money through the 200 restaurants that it owns and operates in 10 different states, uh, but also has a smaller side business in making a take and bake pizza that is available in some grocery stores. Related diversification. Uh, the firm is going to build new or extend its current resources and capabilities to create value. Uh, the firm is going to develop and exploit economies of scope uh, if you remember from our previous discussions, economy of scope uh, are going to create savings when the firm uh, successfully shares resources and capabilities. That is, uh, activities where the average cost of producing two or more different types of products uh, is less than building those products uh, separately and adding together what those costs would be. Uh, or uh, transferring corporate level competencies from one business to another, uh, such as uh, overlapping business practices that you've learned in one business uh, and applying them to a new business line. 
related constrained diversification, PepsiCo. So historically in the carbonated beverage industry, Pepsi expanded into the nearby snack industry through a merger with Frito-Lay uh, back in 1965. Later it expanded on this in the late 90s, uh, acquiring Tropicana products in 1998 and Quaker Oats in 2001. Uh, eventually, uh, this grew to about 50% of their business as of uh, their financial report uh, from 2017. Uh, food accounted for 53% of its uh, revenue. Uh, in a related shift, they have been sh uh, moving towards more and more better for you and good for you products uh, that now make up 50% of its uh, portfolio of products, uh, up from 38% in 2006. Uh, note that that is a product makeup and not a revenue makeup. Related link diversification. Disney. So the Walt Disney Company owns ABC, uh, the Disney Store, ESPN, Disney Radio, uh, movies, uh, now Marvel and uh, Star Wars licensing. And so while there's some overlap between some of these things, uh, being in movies and TVs, somewhat similar. Um, other things such as theme parks and radio are very different. So you have some overlap, but not total, thus related link diversification. Uh, and that is the primary difference between related constrained and related linked. Uh, related constraints, basically all of the businesses are related, uh, closely grouped together. In related link, there is some uh, linkages, some overlap uh, between some of the industries, uh, but they are not all related and linked together. Unrelated diversification. So a firm uh, pursuing this strategy can create value through efficiently allocating resources between its various business units. So for instance, shifting excess cash from one business to unit, unit uh, that has a lot of resources but not a great place to reinvest them uh, to another business unit that is needing cash but could give a better ROI for the corporation. Uh, the firm can also create value through acquiring firms, uh, restructuring those firms' assets to maximize the efficiency, and placing them under rigorous control. So basically, uh, in investing whole, wholly in a company uh, uh, to maximize it as a uh, investment opportunity. And then finally, uh, the firm can focus on creating financial economies to generate value. Uh, this is essentially using the overall size of the corporation to negotiate better terms for the individual business units on uh, loans and things from uh, financial institutions. Unrelated diversification. An example here uh, is United Technologies Co or uh, UTC. They research, develop, and manufacture high-tech products in several areas, including aircraft engines, helicopters, uh, HVAC, fuel cells, elevators, escalators, fire and security, and building systems, uh, and various other industrial products. Uh, UTC is also a large military contractor producing missile systems, military helicopters such as the Black Hawk helicopter. Um, so this is an example of where, uh, try as you might, you will not be able to find a whole lot of linkages between these various uh, industries and therefore it's unrelated diversification. So what is the typical diversification performance metric that you'll get across many industries and many firms? Uh, of course, the resource-based view shows us that some firms can do this better than others. But typically, as you move across the spectrum from single business towards unrelated diversification, you'll get a uh, curvilinear effect. That is, it will initially help your performance as you achieve economies of scope, um, financial economies, uh, you're protected from risk. But as you get into more and more unrelated businesses, uh, it becomes more difficult to perform at a high level and therefore your overall uh, performance tends to drop back off. So what are ways to diversify? There's basically two, uh, greenfield, which is when you organically expand into a new industry or market, 
and acquisition, where you buy your way into a new industry or market. So entry mode, uh, Greenfield, you are relying on your own firm's uh, resources, brand, know-how. Uh, so you're taking your existing brand, your existing technology, and your knowledge of your current customers into a new industry or new geographic market. Um, the speed with which you can accomplish this uh, is going to depend on the overlap between your existing businesses and the new business. So if it's something very related, uh, where you're releasing a product line uh, that's very similar to other product lines or in a very closely related uh, industry, a lot of that brand and technology and customer knowledge uh, among other resources is very applicable and so it's easy for you to get up to speed quickly. Um, uh, an example of this would be you know, Coca-Cola moving into a different beverage uh, market that they previously aren't in. A lot of the overlap with the bottling and uh, advertising uh, transfers very easily. Where if they were trying to move into aerospace uh, that would obviously not be in their comfort zone. So acquisition, uh, your acquired firm's resources are substituted for the firm's resources, at least initially. Uh, so you can use the acquired brand that has already been in the market and establish some reputation uh, with customers. You can use their technology, which may be different than your own. And finally, you can uh, use their customer knowledge uh, from operating in the industry uh, and if those customers are very different for instance if it's in a foreign country that you've not operated in before that can be very useful information so generally acquisition is faster entry uh, than greenfield but can present some further growth problems um, first of all it's very in, uh, difficult to integrate an acquired firm uh, fully and well into your firm and second, if you sort of operate it as a separate entity uh, and you're sort of the parent of that subsidiary, uh, there's some difficulty in some of the learning and stuff that can go on within a firm uh, does not transfer as readily. So when you're deciding between Greenfield and acquisition, you basically uh, just decide which of those two approaches work better. Uh, so if it's an industry where brands are well known uh, the firm's brands, uh, then that might be useful in the Coca-Cola example that we talked about. Uh, if your brand is not known in the new industry or markets you're moving into and heavy advertising would be required to build up that brand, then acquisition might be a better choice. Uh, customers, if they're very similar to your customers, uh, Greenfield makes sense. If they're very different, uh, it doesn't. If you have access to many channels to sell the products. Um, Greenfield can make sense. Uh, if channels are difficult or expensive to access via partnerships or government regulation, it may be easier to just buy a company that has already established those channels for distribution um, than building them yourself. <laughs> Human capital, if the knowledge used in the industry is fairly standardized, uh, and it's easy to find uh, skilled workers. Uh, Greenfield makes sense if it's somehow unique or tacit knowledge and skills. Uh, aqua hiring, as it's called, uh, to acquire uh, employees with the specialized knowledge uh, can be very useful. Uh, same for technology. If new technology uh, can integrate with your existing processes, Greenfield makes sense. Uh, otherwise, acquisition. Uh, might be a better route. Uh, if there are not economies of scale or learning advantages, uh, Greenfield can make sense. If there are significant learning effects or economies of scale, uh, acquiring a firm that has already moved up the learning curve uh, can be very useful. And uh, then if there is some need for speed, uh, so if there's uh, you want to enter rapidly to capture a market opportunity or get a lot more market share off the bat to reach some critical mass, which can be important in like network type uh, products, social networks. If you don't have enough customers, no, your product is useless. Um, acquisition can make a lot of sense. Uh, if 
speed is not an issue a lot of times entering and growing yourself can be the uh, better option. And that concludes this video lecture.